All right, guys, here we go. I'm doing a voiceover in case you're wondering what's happening here. This is my video, and I did a voiceover because I decided I was going to do a Jack Kirby video. You're looking at Jack Kirby comics right here. That was a Tales to Astonish with the Human Top, first appearance of the Human Top. Here's a Tales of Suspense, early Golden Age type stuff. Uh, I'm sorry, late Golden Age, early Silver Age type Jack Kirby stuff. You know, I, just, I decided to do a different type of video because I freaking love Jack Kirby, man. He is, as far as I'm concerned, the ultimate contributor to comics. He's my favorite artist, as is the case with many people, um, for good reason. You know, he probably has the most contributions, the most, the greatest number and most significant, uh, actually, contributions in comic book history, as far as a creator goes. And I'm a fan, in case you can't tell. So you're looking at things here, like that's that I just put down there. That's a Metalo early... Uh, Iron Man prototype issue, here's an early Doctor Doom prototype issue. Normally I'd be talking about things like, oh, this is the first appearance of so-and-so, or, you know, this is significant for this reason, but really this is just a video I wanted to have devoted to the artwork of Jack Kirby. He worked on the early Iron Mans, as you're seeing there, and Tales of Suspense before Iron Man had his own um, issue, before Iron Man was even in the Avengers, actually. Here's Iron Man battling Jack Frost. You know, Jack Kirby, for those of you who don't know, is basically the workhorse of Marvel uh, in the 60s, which is when all of the major characters that you see in the movies these days came out. People like, uh, characters like Iron Man, Captain America, who he brought back from the Golden Age, who you see right here, who he also uh, worked on in the Silver Age, the Avengers, the X-Men, the Fantastic Four. You know, he was just all over the place in terms of working on major, major comics. The Hulk. He was the creator and worked for the first few issues on all of those characters' titles that I just listed, their original titles. Here he is even on Daredevil, contributing on a cover. This is Daredevil number uh, 13, it looks like. You know, I don't think he did anything else actually for Daredevil, but he was doing at least a little contribution even here on Daredevil. He was literally all over the place in the Silver Age. And uh, <clears throat> mostly what I have are Silver Age Jack Kirby. This is where my Jack Kirby's go. Here he is on the Incredible Hulk number four. But, you know, I want this video to be a little bit different. I don't want to talk just about the comics that I'm going through. I want to talk a little bit about Jack Kirby, the man. And, uh, you know, he was, like I've been saying, the major contributor to almost the entire Marvel Universe as far as the major characters are concerned. Um, he was Stan Lee's pal uh, throughout the 60s. They worked together creatively and enjoyed each other's company, at least towards the end when uh, in the late 60s, I think it was, Jack Kirby left to go to DC actually for a little while because he was bitter with how things were at Marvel, but then he did end up coming back and doing some more good work. Um, he worked even, you know, like I was saying here on the X-Men like you're looking at, but he was working on so many different issues, so many different comics, that he would only work usually for the first mm, 5 to 20 issues. On the X-Men, for instance, I think he worked until issue number 19 or so, and then maybe one or two after that. But then they phased him out because he just didn't have time to work on all those different comics. He was working on, think about what he was working on. At one time, he was working on The Incredible Hulk, The X-Men, The Avengers, all at the same time. All at the same time. Oh, not to mention Thor, by the way. Just throw that one in there. Pretty much solely a Kirby creation. You know, Stan Lee takes the credit for a lot of these as we're looking here at X-Men number one. Stan Lee will tell you that he created the X-Men, but the way that Marvel worked back then, if you read a lot about it, you could very easily argue that Jack Kirby had just as much, if not more, of a role creating many of the characters that we know and love, as did Stan Lee. Stan Lee was the writer, and he would always list himself first as the writer in the credits, because he was the man with the plan, Stan Lee. But Jack Kirby was, you know, <clears throat> arguably, arguably the creative genius behind a lot of that. I gotta take a sip of water here, give me a sec. Here comes the X-Men number three, first appearance of the blob. Awesome. Anyways, like I said, I'm gonna have this video be a little bit different and tell you a little bit about Jack Kirby the man as I go through all these uh, Jack Kirby comics of mine that are golden in the Silver Age. So, let's tell you some stuff as you're enjoying this Kirby artwork. Some interesting stuff about Jack Kirby that you might not have known. You know, like, for, Jack Kirby doesn't get, basically, the gist of the story with Jack Kirby is that he doesn't get a lot of credit 
or credit's due. As famous as he is, he should be even more famous because he worked on creations even like Spider-Man, arguably. And as you know, most people think of Stanley and Steve Ditko as the creators of Spider-Man. Most people don't even know that Kirby was on Spider-Man in the beginning. Yes, he was. I'm absolutely, completely fact, cannot be disproven. Kirby was involved with Spider-Man in the beginning. The dispute starts after that fact, which everybody agrees on. I'm just going to get into it real here quick, actually, because this is one of those interesting things that, uh, you know, you, you might not know. Uh, maybe you do know if you're a big Amazing Spider-Man fan. I didn't know this at first. I thought it was pretty interesting when I found out about it. Let me just tell you a little bit about the true history of the creation of Spider-Man, even though you're looking at X-Men here. Jack Kirby even had a major influence on the early days of Spider-Man. Um... I'm just going to read you a little excerpt here that I put together after doing a little bit of research on my own about the true history of the creation of Spider-Man. So the original unrecognized prototype issue for Spider-Man, and I'm going to get into Jack Kirby the man here stuff in a second about his personal life and his early childhood and stuff like that, but first off, the early prototype issue for Spider-Man was actually a comic called Adventures of the Fly, issue number one. The first appearance of Spider-Man an amazing fantasy number 15 that everybody knows about um, was an issue that Kirby, Ditko, and Lee all worked on. Uh, the truth is that Jack Kirby, along with Joe Simon, who's an editor, uh, created a character before Amazing Fantasy number 15 even came out that paved the way for Spider Man before Jack Kirby even started working at Marvel. Kirby first came to Lee with the four to five page splash page series proposal for Spider-Man for Amazing Span uh, Fantasy number 15 when Lee asked him to come up with something for Spider-Man. Lee claims that he hashed out the main ideas for the character with Jack Kirby beforehand, and given the way that Marvel worked at the time, it would have been common for Lee to give the broad strokes for a character and then to have Kirby draw the pages, giving Kirby liberty to work out many of the details of the character and storyline by writing a story with pictures, so to speak. Although, for a first um, issue of a series, Lee, Lee may have actually devoted more time to the project beforehand and hashed out a more detailed idea for the character with Kirby before Kirby went off to draw those first proposal, proposal pages. But in any case, Kirby was taken off of the project after drawing those initial proposal pages, although he did still work on the early cover artwork for the Amazing Spider-Man series. Uh, Kirby was replaced by Ditko, and Lee claims that he chose Ditko to do the Spider-Man artwork instead of Kirby because he said that Kirby's Spider-Man was too bulky in his five-page proposal. In any case, I'll agree that Kirby came in with those first initial proposal pages for Spider-Man, but they make different claims about the degree to which Spider-Man in those initial Kirby sketches resembled the Spider-Man that first appeared in Amazing Fantasy 15, the one that we all know. There's a bit of publishing history it makes a strong case for Jack Kirby along with Joe Simon and Sid Jacobson as the creative minds behind what eventually became Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy number 15. Real quick, the fly and the spider spry uh, is basically the whole story here. The fly and the spider spry. And I hope you're still watching this video here, not just listening to what I'm saying. You're looking at a prototype issue for Sandman here now. I hope you're enjoying this Kirby artwork, man. I figured I would just, you know, give you some interesting <laughs> stuff to hear while you're looking at interesting stuff to see. Hope you approve of my methods here. Uh, back to the Fly and the Spider Spry. The Fly and the Spider Spry, the first appearances of those two characters are in Adventures of the Fly number one, where the fly battles a villain called the Spider Spry. The fly has Spider-Man-like abilities, but looks nothing like Spider-Man, and the Spider Spry has only some of Spider-Man's abilities, but is a dead ringer appearance-wise for what would normally be considered a prototype character by Overstreet and the like. So the spider spry, a humanoid spider combo type character, is shown hanging from his web in a spider pose waiting to pounce on the fly on the cover of this Adventures of the Fly number one, issue number one. And Joe Simon and Jack Kirby drew this issue as well as other issues of Adventures of the Fly. Also have noticed the fact that the creation of the fly rose out of an editor criticizing that there was an old hat feel to a character that was in the works called the Silver Spider. That's a character that never made it to the pages. The editor, Sid Jacobson of Harvey Publications at the time, suggested that the character be more spider-like in appearance and abilities, he even suggested the web shooter. So the fly and the spider spry rose as a result of that constructive criticism in place of this character, the silver spider, that never made it to the page. So there you have an interesting little backstory there of the creation of Spider-Man. But back to Jack Kirby. The, you know, Jack Kirby really is the one who's involved in all that's going on there with uh, 
with the early Adventures of the Fly. And uh, that's where Spider-Man, if you do your own research and read between the lines, that's where I think he came from. You look at it yourself if you don't believe me. Anyways, hope you're enjoying the pictures that you're seeing here with Colossus. I'm going to take just about, you know, 15, 20 seconds break here from talking so I can uh, indulge myself in a little something. Maybe you'll hear what I'm doing. And uh, enjoy these strange tales that you're looking at here, these monsters that Jack Kirby's drawn for us in the late 50s and early 60s. Taboo, going through the streets. You know, when he's working on these monsters, he's basically warming up for working on the superheroes that made his way in the 60s. Some of his best artwork, I would say, is in the late 50s when he's drawing monsters, but you can see how that let him transition into being so good at drawing superheroes, like he did in the 60s. This is a prototype issue of Magneto, by the way. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break. This one you're looking at right now, Wally Wood actually inked that one for Jack Kirby, who penciled it. Strange Tales, you know, Plant Man, Human Torch. Fun, fun comics. So a little bit more about Jack Kirby Man, as you're looking at these pictures here. Um, just some interesting factoids is how I'm going to do it, okay? <coughs> I hope that works for everybody. So Jack Kirby was actually Jewish, and Jack Kirby... It's not Jack Kirby's real name. Jack Kirby was born Jacob, or Yaakov, Kurtzberg in 1917. He grew up in a tenement house on the Lower East Side in New York, and he basically grew up poor. He was the son of uh, poor Austrian parents who were immigrants. And as a kid, when he could not afford them, Jacob, Jack Kirby, Jacob Kurtzberg, would take newspapers from his neighbor's trash when he couldn't afford to buy his own to read the comics out of those newspapers and practice drawing on the papers. This is almost, this is like a real crazy <laughs> American rags to riches story that you see in a movie, but it's actually the truth about what I, who I would argue is the world's greatest comic book creator. Also has one of the greatest backstories as far as his life, as you'll see as I keep going on here. Rags to riches, baby. Um, Jack Kirby joked that as a child he wanted to be a crooked politician. This is an interesting thing about Jack Kirby. He's got a little bit of, uh, you know, street in him, a little bit of street thug in him, because he grew up in a rough part of New York, and he had to develop that part of his personality in order to get by. Um, so he joked he wanted to be a crooked politician as a kid because um, it was a natural way of things where he came from. The crooked politicians were having a great time whenever he saw them in the restaurants when he was skating by on the sidewalk. They were enjoying life. Um, he told his mom a lot of times that he wanted to be a crooked politician, you know, but she n never wanted any part of that, so that didn't happen. But Kirby was in a gang growing up, in the Suffolk Street Gang is what it was called, and if you know of the Yancey Street Gang that appears in the early Fantastic Four issues, that's all based off of the Suffolk Street Gang. Kirby says in interviews that that was entire. the Yancey Street Gang is based entirely off of uh, the Suffolk Street Gang. This is a cool early Incredible Hulk right here, by the way, that you're seeing issue number two. First time he appears in green skin. Kirby's all over the place on these early ones. Anyways, back to Yancey Street and the Suffolk Street gang. Um, he's, he would get in fights with other kids in these gangs. And, um, you know, he included a lot of gangs in a lot of his later comics. Uh, and they were inspired by him growing up on Suffolk Street. Um, when he was first starting out, he was basically a natural. Everybody was amazed that Jack Kirby was able to draw as well as he could and as quickly as he could. He drew really fast. Um, at one point he was drawing three comic strips in three different genres under three different names. Just to give you an idea of the variety and, uh, what's the word, how prolific Jack Kirby was. He was a speed um, producer of comics, but also as Stan Lee often says, he also produced quality consistently. He would stay up late. He would come in early if he needed to. He would work on the weekends if he needed to just to get a page exactly right. 
Stan Lee talks about times, I've seen him in interviews, where he talks about Jack Kirby, how he would work on a page for an hour. It would be 12 at night, and Stan would say, okay, let's go home, and Jack Kirby would rip it up and say, no, it's no good, and start over again. He was just a crazy, meticulous perfectionist like that. Um, he has a very interesting way of talking, if you ever listen to Jack Kirby interviews. He often pauses and changes the subject mid-sentence. Um, he's not a very, uh, what's the word? Not, definitely not a very dainty um, personality. He's very in your face, you know, because of where he came from and his history growing up. He's a very kind person, is my impression of Jack Kirby. And he was actually wronged a lot in his, during his career and taken advantage of a lot of his, uh, in his career because he was so kind. He was kind of stepped over and didn't get credit or money for the creations that are now worth billions of dollars now at the movies today in Hollywood. It's crazy. There's a whole scene going on still with his family trying to get the money they deserve, by the way, for that stuff. But that's a very negative scene, so I'm going to try to stay off of that. Since we're doing better things here, like looking at the Fantastic Four, which you're looking at right now. Um, anyways, Jack Kirby... Um, Basically, okay, a lot of comic book creators were able to take positions in the army making propaganda posters and instruction pamphlets, but Kirby, Kirby actually served in World War II as a combat infantryman. He was in the shit. He left the military with the rank of private first class and a combat infantry, ba infantry badge, um, and he got a bronze battle star. Uh, and after World War II, the superhero comics market actually kind of faltered uh, because there were just too many superhero comics flooding the market. And uh, he played, Jack Kirby then played a big part in filling a gap in what people were asking for with young romance types of uh, comics, which is kind of interesting. He also did some horror, horror comics. Um, Kirby was such a workaholic that this is one of my favorite sto Kirby stories that I'm sure you've heard if you know a lot about Jack Kirby, but if you haven't heard this story, it's just classic. Many people have told this story, so you know that it's true. I've heard many different people say this. In the late 50s and 60s, it got to the point where Kirby was so engrossed in creating the stories and the artwork that he was working on um, that he had to give up driving. He had to give up driving. He could not drive anymore. Um, he'd get in the car, and he'd try to drive, and he'd wind up on the curb or on the sidewalk because he'd be, his mind would start wandering because he'd be thinking about a story. And so he just wouldn't drive anymore. He was literally devoting his entire life to making these comics. He put his heart and soul into them. And you can tell when you read them. I mean, they're great. Look at that amazing adventures you see there on the bottom. Captain America number 100 there. Spider-Man number 10. Here we got a Fantastic Four number 47. Classic Mr. Fantastic thing. And even Torch artwork. He's just a true pleasure to look at. Look at his artwork there with Doctor Doom and the thing battling. Love it. Love it. He, Jack Kirby, of course, created Doctor Doom along with Stan Lee. So many of those other characters from Fantastic Four. It's Fantastic Four number eight that you're looking at there, which is a really fun story. I'm sure Jack Kirby had some input into making this story more than just drawing because it's all about Fantastic Four going bust, basically going poor. Anyways, um... A couple more interesting facts for you about uh, Mr. Kirby. Um, when he was working back in the late 50s and early 60s, all the houses used to have basements. And there was a studio called The Dungeon. Um, it was called The Dungeon because it was tiny and cramped and full of Jack Kirby's stuff. It was piled up high and there was not enough light in it. And that's where he worked in the dungeon of a basement in a house. <laughs> and he called it a studio. And um, it was quiet, and he didn't really care much about his surroundings, and it was just a place for him to do his work. Um, in 1961, after scraping by, basically, uh, in what was really a heavily censored comic book industry, if you don't know the story about the comic code authority and what they did to comics, they basically ruined comics for about six or seven years and then it slowly was able to come back after the censorship that it suffered from as a result of that um, whole 
government intervention debacle. Anyway, it's getting a little off track there. Um, after that period of time, Kirby was approached by Stan Lee about doing a superhero comic. And you can see here where the beginning of greatness is starting. Their collaboration was called The Fantastic Four. And um, it was quickly followed by the creation of The Incredible Hulk, and then Thor, and then Spider-Man. Um, and, you know, there were some legal battles between Lee and Ditko and Kirby uh, as far as them trying to claim creative rights over those characters. And unfortunately, Kirby never really saw much from those characters, which is really sad. Um, but they did result in some great comics, as you can see right there. Awesome freaking comics. Even all the way up to number 102, I think, is the last one, where Kirby was working on the Fantastic Four. I do believe. Huh, even then, it's got to be almost 1970, and he's still drawing monsters. It's really funny. Um, anything else that I want to tell you factoid-wise about Kirby? Not really, I guess. You know, just, I guess, when I think about Jack Kirby, I think about a tough guy, man who's got a soft heart, and I hate to say this because it's a metaphor that gets used over and over and over again, but it's so true. I think of the thing, and Jack Kirby even admitted over and over again, as you look here at um, this Fantastic Four number 99 that's got Black Bolt on it. Black Bolt's a great Jack Kirby creation. Um, J Jack Kirby was kind of tough guy, you know, because of where he's from. Like I said, he was from you know, a rough part of uh, New York City. He would get into fights all the time. It was normal for fights to happen after school. You know, no, nobody was killing each other back then. They were just, you know, getting into fist fights because that's what kids did then. And then the war came along, and he went into World War II. And then when he came back, he wrote about World War II and drew about World War II in his comics. A lot of Captain America came out of that. And, you know, like I was saying with The Thing... Thing is one of those characters that's a rough exterior. He's been through a lot. It's made him tough. But you can always tell that he's got a soft spot on the inside. And whenever you watch interviews with Kirby, especially when he's talking to fans in the early days before things got really crazy, you know, with crazy crowded comic conventions and things like that, basically anything pre, uh, pre 1990 ish, you can see when he's talking to his fans that he really loves what he does. He loves it. And he even talks about how people should do what they love. And that's why he never, he claims he was never really all that beat up about not seeing a whole lot of money from his creations because he said he loved uh, to draw. That was why he got into comics. And that's what he loved to do. This is the hate monger right here, an awesome Lee Kirby creation. Who ends up being a clone of Hitler, actually, whose superpower is to blast people with his hate gun. <laughs> makes people hate. He's able to basically control them through mind control. The Infant Terrible, let's see what you're looking at right here. An awesome character. He's basically an alien who's huge, who almost destroys the, the world, but then the Fantastic Four save the day by, um, how do they, how does the story go? Oh, you know what happens? They end up, <laughs> somehow Mr. Fantastic ends up letting the infant's, alien, the alien who's an infant, their parents know that he's on Earth, and the parents come to rescue him and save that infant before he destroys Earth. And he's basically just an infant who's wandering around destroying things, and for the first, like, 13, 14 pages, you're not sure what's going on. You're trying to figure out why he's acting so erratically, and then you realize it's because he's an infant. He's an alien, yes, but he's super young. <laughs> it's one of those fun stories. Here, Daredevil's in the Fantastic Four, which is unusual and interesting. Um, you know, in the last uh, few minutes here of the video, I'm going through mostly Fantastic Four and a couple other things like Spider-Man, um, here's the first appearance of the Black Bolt. Awesome comic. You're about to see the first appearance of the Silver Surfer and Galactus. But I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about Mr. Jack Kirby. Um, I already told you a little bit about his early history. Other things I want to tell you, you know, maybe actually, well... Yeah, I think I'm actually not going to tell you too, too much more. 
because it is getting towards the end of the video here. But um, I guess I do have to fill some space. So what else can I tell you about Jack Kirby? Uh, an awesome uh, way to learn about Jack Kirby is to um, actually look at a comic that has Jack Kirby artwork that you like. Figure out what it is you like about it. Then just scroll through and look at covers who have similar, that have similar types of artwork that are also like Kirby, obviously, and read one or two of them. And you're going to start to notice patterns because Kirby was prolific and he was fairly consistent. So even though what I just said might sound like maybe fairly commonsensical, the reason why I suggest it is because once you find one or two comics that you like that Kirby's done, you're probably going to find 20 to 30 in a run that he's done in a series that you're going to like. Because if you like one, you're going to like them all. They are that similar in terms of quality and the type of uh, quality. The way that he draws characters is very consistent. Uh, but, you know, people just can't get enough of it. I guess not having a whole lot of variety in his drawing is a bad thing. But he did start to mix it up a little bit later on, you know, with some of the, uh, the machines that he got into drawing. He's very famous for drawing futuristic machines, paying attention to detail. And obviously here you're looking at Dr. Doom. He's great drawing Dr. Doom, man. Doctor Doom got me so excited whenever I would see him in the Fantastic Four. I don't think I've ever read a Doctor Doom issue that was not good in the early Fantastic Four. You know, later on that's not true, of course. I bet there's thousands, maybe even 10,000. I would not be surprised, eh, 10,000 maybe not. But I bet there are thousands of appearances of Doctor Doom if you, read, if you look for all the appearances of Doctor Doom in all comic books from, you know, when he first appeared in 1961, I think it was, either 1961 or 1962 with Fantastic Four number five, um, up until now. I bet there are thousands. But those early Fantastic Four Silver Age issues from the 60s that I'm showing you here with Stan Lee doing the writing and Jack Kirby doing the drawing is just strictly Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, the best team up in comic book history, if you ask me, as far as a writer teaming up with an artist, as far as them having synergy and creating good work. Stanley and Jack Kirby are the best ever. Another one I really like, another team up I like is um, the later, the second run of the X Men, Chris Claremont and uh, John Byrne, and also Chris Claremont when he's working with Dave Cockrum on the earlier ones, like issues 94 up to like 115, I think it is. Those are awesome uh, team ups as well. Also, of course, Stanley with John Romita when he's working on Spider Man. You know, Spider-Man fans tend to be crazy. Here's an early Incredible Hulk number five, Stan Lee and uh, Jack Kirby. You know, but uh, as a, like I was saying, John Romita and Stan Lee on Spider-Man, they're actually my favorite uh, team up on Spider-Man. True Spider-Man fans will say that's blasphemous, that Ditko is God. <laughs> Even though you've now heard my rant on how Ditko didn't necessarily create Spider-Man, Kirby might have been the one who did it along with a couple other people who had some input. Here's an awesome comic, Captain America number 100. His first appearance uh, in his first solo uh, Silver Age series. It's of course Kirby working on it there. I have about, I think, 10 of these where Kirby and Lee are working on him. But uh, yeah, Doctor Doom was awesome from Fantastic Four. And the other team ups that I've been talking about between the artists and writer are awesome, but none of them are as good as uh, Lee and Kirby who you're seeing again here on Cap Captain America. Stanley doing the writing, Jack Kirby doing the drawing. Look at this one right here, man. Jeez, that is classic Kirby with the fist pumping out at you. That's one of his best uh, abilities is to accentuate body parts in ways that would never actually happen in real life, but to make them appear somehow plausible enough to make sense in a drawing. And you, you wind up getting um, drawings, pictures like that. Or you get crazy looking versions of the human body that, you know, to a young mind looking at that just <laughs> sets your mind on fire with the possibilities, you know. Huge fists creating explosions and etc. One of the things that makes comics great. Well, this is just about the very end of the video here. After these Captain Americas. I'm going to show that Spidey, and I hope you enjoy uh, the different sort of take that I had here on showing Jack Kirby comics. Um, 
I want to let you know a little bit about Jack Kirby because I think he's interesting. His story is almost as interesting as his actual artwork. Well, no. I don't want to say that. <laughs> Can't compare to his actual artwork. But his backstory is very interesting if you like Jack Kirby. Learning about him is an interesting thing. And so I hope you appreciate uh, what you might have learned or heard in this video. All right, then.